lost count of how many nights we've spent here over the last 18 months. It's a sublime experience every night. It's the middle of the night at an Israeli army installation in the Golan Heights on the Syrian border. After the IDF have secured a location, FAI personnel are transported to the handoff point. Local Syrians will quickly pull up, greet the IDF at the fence, greet the guys, help them with their bags, and then deliver them to one of our ministry bases in Syria, where lives are saved and lives are changed. I sit here watching this bizarre but beautiful thing unfold over and over again and I wonder, how did this happen? How did we get here? And more often than not, I feel stirred and reminded by the conviction, by this reality that we are who we are and that we do what we do out here on the frontier in some strange but profoundly concrete sense because of something that happened on the shores of England in 1865. Until day, a young man by the name of Hudson Taylor walked out of a church service and onto a beach in Brighton. These are his words. On Sunday, June 25th, 1865, unable to bear the sight of a congregation of a thousand or more Christian people rejoicing in their own security, while millions were perishing for lack of knowledge, I wandered out on the sands alone, in great spiritual agony. And there the Lord conquered my unbelief, and I surrendered myself to God for His service. I told Him that all the responsibility as to the issues and consequences must rest with Him, and that as His servant it was mine to obey and to follow Him, His to direct, to care for, and to guide me, and those who might labor with me. Need I say that peace at once flowed into my burdened heart? There and then I asked him for 24 fellow workers, two for each of the 11 inland provinces of China, which were without a missionary, and two for Mongolia. In writing the petition in the margin of my Bible I had with me, I returned home with a heart enjoying rest such as it had been a stranger to for months. Then and there, the China Inland Mission was born. And in some strange way, I believe so too was our spiritual family, FAI.
Qatar <laughs> doing it in Syria. Hudson yeah. Taylor, yeah. the th película. Yeah. Yeah. Talk talk about Hudson Taylor. Eh, con relación a Syria. Uh, whatever. Mm. Hudson Taylor. Any anything. Cerca de uh, Hudson Taylor. Yeah. Like, uh, como es como es el un uh, inspiración para tu vida. Mm. Yeah. It was two thousand and eleven. My second son, Elisha, had just been born a few months before that. We were living in the South Pacific. We were committed to laboring and living there for, for a long time. Yet my heart was very much burdened for the Middle East for, for years. And I had tried to go, but the Lord had closed the doors. And in 2011, I was driving to the grocery store to pick up diapers. And the Lord spoke very clearly to me in the car as I was pulling into the parking lot. And the Lord spoke to us to lay down what we were doing and to put our hands to the plow to engage the Islamic world. Cuando puedo ver el testimonio de Hudson Taylor, eh, puedo mirar de que no solamente a través de la Biblia dice vayan y hagan discípulos, sino también como Juan Bautista preparar el camino para lo que va a venir. Entonces eh, miro que a través de su vida, a través de su servicio, de su ministerio, eh, no entrar al campo como un misionero o decir voy a llevar la palabra de Dios, sino que a través de lo que abres el camino, a través de tu profesión, abres camino para que la gente conozca a través de tu servicio a Jesús. You know, Hudson Taylor lived, uh, he served among the Chinese people for 51 years. I love his consistency and his perseverance. The fact of the matter is that if the days ahead are going to be defined by crisis, if crisis is going to explode throughout the earth, and I believe Jesus made it very clear that it will, then we need to see crisis, we need to see catastrophe, we need to see chaos essentially as its own unique mission field. Right now we're heading out to the front staging area. Uh, we're going to set up the ambulance at the CCP up there. So effectively what they'll do, if everything goes according to plan, is bring the casualties to us, usually in the back of the pickup. We'll stabilize them as best as possible and then uh, organize uh, transportation back to the field hospital. It's probably a 10 minute drive. It was the day before Christmas Eve, 2011. We were at my wife's parents' house for Christmas and I, I took my, my son, Elisha, I took him for a walk in the stroller. And I had a, a book with me that I was reading as we walked and I had the book on the handlebar of the stroller and was walking and reading and it was the, the, the story of the birth and the development and the growth of the China Inland Mission detailing and chronicling Hudson Taylor and his family's journey from the UK to China and the birth of this amazing work of God. Pues a mí me impacta su vida en el sentido de la forma en cómo modificó Dios en su vida para poder eh, preparar el camino en China eh, para llevar la palabra de Dios, ¿no? Con un equipo sólido, eh, eh, un equipo 
que tenía que estar sujeto a cambios de una realidad cultural, de una realidad en las personalidades, de una realidad médica, ¿no? con un contexto tan diferente, pero a la vez con este contexto eh, incluirse como equipo en ese contexto y tener la solidez de poder estar sujeto a cambios en medio de ese contexto para poder mirar a Jesús manifestarse a través de su servicio. Entonces, I went on that walk with a prayer in my heart, Lord, speak to us about what this thing is that you've called us to in the Islamic world and in the Middle East. And I came back from that walk with incredible clarity. It was bizarre how much clarity came in such a short amount of time. Me impacta mucho cuando él, a través de, de una película que vi, él habla de su texto favorito, ¿no? Permaneced en mí y yo en vosotros, dice, ¿no? Porque separados de mí nada puedes hacer, dice en Juan 15. Entonces me impacta que su apego no era multitudes, su apego era Jesús. Y como su apego era Jesús, los frutos se iban a dar solos. I was reading two pages in this book about Hudson Taylor and in it the the author was describing the nature of his ministry and the different moving parts and components and it was like three words jumped off the page at me international recruitment and advocacy regional mobilization and training and local evangelism and discipleship that the the international component of calling and recruitment was for the purpose of mobilizing and training which was for the purpose of engaging locally in the interior Next month we're celebrating the seven year anniversary since the, the birth of FAI. And so we're in a season of, of reflecting and, and pondering and seeking the Lord and having lots of discussions together as a spiritual family and you know, digging into the life of Hudson Taylor, digging into the, into the Word together. And uh, we're here this week uh, in Luxembourg in, in Belgium processing praying, talking about what the next seven years looks like, and thought it was fitting to, to come here where so many young men lost their lives for a cause that changed history, saved a continent, dismantled a dark empire. We are standing here in a, in a forest after the initial great victories of the Allies on the shores of Normandy, in the fields of Normandy, northern France and Belgium. There was just absolute ultimate destruction that, that, that took place here. People scrapped for their lives. I can't even, I can't even fathom that shrapnel and trees and the foxholes still in the ground and the village that they walk to. You know. We wanted to come here because I think there's profound parallels between, between what you feel here and what we feel looking out at the nations in this moment of history, praying for and working towards the advance of the gospel in these remaining 7,000 some odd people groups who have never heard the gospel.
one of the things that I love about military history in places like this is that it testifies to young men who obeyed orders and went to places that they didn't know or even really understand. You know, a lot of the young men that were in these foxholes here in Bastogne probably never heard of Bastogne in their life. They probably couldn't even find it on a map, you know. And I think this kind of a mentality is so uh, easily transferable into kingdom gospel realities. You know, Hudson Taylor wrote this in a season of uh, mounting suffering and persecution in China. And he wrote this to the China Inland Mission. He said, you're now placed in a position to help the Chinese as you have never been before. They see that you are being a foreigner is now no protection, but increases your danger. Let them see that. Let them see that you are rejoicing in God and that you do not need any other protection and that you do not go away. This, l listen to this line. He says, put your trust in God and be prepared either to suffer or to be delivered as he sees best. That is the mentality of a soldier. That is the mentality that says, I don't care where I go, just send me where it's most useful for the cause. This availability to the Spirit and to the Son of God for whatever He wills is a mark that you cannot produce in yourself. You cannot read about it and say, I will do the same. No, it's a gift. It is something that you should pray about. You can only receive. That soldier mentality, if that can get into the bloodstream of the church, then we can look at these unoccupied, unengaged fields in the nations, and then we can see them one for his name. We need to stand before heaven, stand before our master and say, you're the commander, give us orders. You give orders, we go. Use me, spend me how you want. Sometimes we are tempted to say that we are too weak, we are incapable of something, we don't have the resources, and we might be right. Just as all these men who died in these forests uh, for a good cause were weak in themselves, they were weeping, they were hurting, and many of them died. But taken together, they were fighting for a just cause and this is what makes a name for them. That kind of a person can change history the same way that these young men changed history by listening to their commanders, by going where they were told to go, live or die. Only in these moments when you have a full sacrifice, a sacrifice by full burning, that you have the real gospel because this is what the Son of God did. This is what Yeshua did on the cross. The heart of God has always been in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power of Bastogne. These young men came into this forest not knowing whether they would come out again. And I think that kind of a mentality is what we need on the earth today in the nations. I'm going into that forest and I don't know if I'm coming out, but it's worth it. It's only when you have a full sacrifice that you have a full glory. Are we willing to lay our lives down? Why do you care about Syria? Because God cares about Syria. Um, I, I really over the last couple of years, God's done some things in my life and just um, just revealing how much uh, He loves people and the lengths that He will go to to reach them. For the most part, Israel has stayed out of the war. But how could the Jewish state respond to this crisis and to the people on the other side? They decided to be a good neighbor. 
CBN News has an exclusive inside look at what has been a secret mission by the Israeli Defense Forces. As Chris Mitchell reports, it's a one-of-a-kind Middle East story that combines the IDF, a Christian ministry, and the brutality of the Syrian civil war. FAI teamed up with Operation Good Neighbor, an Israeli mission that delivered tons of food, medical supplies, clothes, while treating thousands of injured Syrians in Israeli hospitals. Uh, Colonel uh, Marco Moreno. Marco Moreno. Lieutenant Colonel Marco Marino is a former senior intelligence officer in the Israel Defense Forces and an expert on the threats coming from Israel's northern border. After the Syrian civil war began, the army assigned Moreno to come up with a response to the carnage. He's formed an incredible partnership with Christians to bring help to some of the world's most desperate people. Thank you. Now, maybe for some of you, it sounds like a joke, right? Uh, Christians and Jews helping the Muslims. But it is the reality. Listen, I was proud, really proud to do this thing in behalf of the IDF. But I'm much more proud to be part of a Christian ministry. That worked in Syria in the dangerous place on earth. שפועל במקומות המסוכנים ביותר בסוריה, שזה מקום מאוד מסוכן בעולם. כי הם רוצים להתמקד בישראל. והם רוצים להתמקד בישוע. One of the most interesting things that will ever be in my Christian walk, I'm sure, is my uh, entry with my fellow teammates into uh, Syria, and that included starting in the Golan Heights, meeting on the top of um, Mount Hermon. We were transported by horse or donkey down the mountain in the middle of the night into uh, a place we'd never been. Our goal is to be able to go and provide pediatric uh, care to the population. And then out of that, uh, understand the need of the population and then be able to grow the team as the need grows. The Apostle Paul talks about becoming all things to all men. I feel like the ministry of Hudson Taylor was very distinctive and very strong in saying, we want to be incarnational. We want to not call this community to become European. You know, but to just uh, humble themselves to say, how can I be incarnational? How can I connect with these people in a way that is relevant? My desire will be first to lay a foundation, a foundation that will be uh, a relational foundation. You know, just as we look at the gospel again, we see Jesus sitting with the prostitute, sitting with the forgotten. So first and foremost, building relationship. And then out of that, uh, building the medical team uh, to provide care for the people at the end is outside of the gospel is really care for those people and love on them so that they understand that it's not an agenda behind it it's truly the love of the father through us that we're able to do what we're doing the reason we're focusing so much on unreached people groups is because the reached have already been reached they already have it so we go on to people who haven't had it. A changing world is going to require a flexible missiology. Jesus made it clear that the, the closer that we approach his return, we're going to see an increase in catastrophe, in crisis, plagues, pestilences, famines, earthquakes, people rising up against each other, all of these things, okay? But if that's the case, we need to have a missiology that sees that as an opportunity, that's, that's listening to the Spirit of God, that's saying, God, give us creative opportunities and ideas in terms of how to access unreached people groups in the midst of crisis. If we say that we love Jesus, we have to do what is in our power to give him what he wants. And what he wants is his perfect inheritance among the nations. For a thousand tongues to sing 
There's so many things about Hudson Taylor that are profound and, and influential and have, have shaped us as a people and an organization, but I don't know if there's anything that's shaped us more than his commitment to what he called the interior. That's the name that charms our fear. It marked the organization, the China Inland Mission, but it also marked a generation as the student volunteer movement grew up in the wake of Taylor's leadership and the leadership of a, a number of other leaders and mission agencies. This issue of the interior was thrust into the conscience of the global church. Most of the unreached in the, in the world today are there because it's the most di they're the most difficult. Uh, there's language barriers, there's uh, terrain barriers, there's access to countries, there's many things that are against making it easy. So all the easy ones have been reached. When I think about the unreached, I just think about how people think that they have unreached in their neighborhoods. And I think they have a wrong view of what that word means because it's not really about them not knowing Jesus is about access to the gospel. There are places in the world today that have people that could walk for miles and miles and days and days and never run into a Christian. And therefore they would never hear the name of Jesus. They would never know that their sin debt has been paid by the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so therefore they are doomed to eternity in hell. There's just an inequitable distribution of resources. Uh, that needs to be uh, transferred to the places that need to hear the story the most. It's going to take some, some new thinking and we're going to have to hear from the Holy Spirit and the Lord's going to have to direct. And our yes has to be on the table. We need obedient followers of Christ that are willing to give their life uh, for the sake of others, just like he did for us. I think this is the call today. The call to pray and to labor towards this, the opening up of the interior places of the earth in our generation, the places that are the most difficult to engage, the places that are the most difficult to get into, that we as believers would take seriously this issue of the frontier, this issue of the interior. So now thy blessed name I love, thy will would ever be mine. Had I a thousand hearts to give, my Lord, the all. My Lord, they all were thine. I was called to be a physician. I had no idea about medical missions, uh, uh, specifically Middle Eastern missions at all, during most of my adult life, although I had been called to be a surgeon and a doctor. But uh, about five years ago, the Lord just turned me completely around and just turned my heart around and, and ignited my heart for Him in the Middle East. and. Um, that the ability to do medicine just allows the, every door to be opened. Early on in Hudson Taylor's journey, he came to a number of very important realizations and conclusions that would shape his life and legacy in very profound ways. The first was the power of medicine to push the boundaries of frontier missions. And the second was the issue of prayer. In a much different context, in a very similar way, we came to the same conclusions.
C-section's been harder and harder and harder, and we certainly miss the anesthesiologist. All on today was trying to have my morning coffee. Gunfire everywhere. No problem. So we're getting some pretty heavy bombing today. Lots of mortars. Um, we've had a couple hit pretty close to the hospital. And we have one this morning when we're on the when we're on the roof uh, having a coffee. Um, we've only had two patients so far. It's definitely been our closest call to mortars since being here. It gives yeah. us a new appreciation for a mortar bomb, I think. It's interesting what you think your reactions will be when one lands really close and what actually happens. Yeah, this <laughs> I know when I was on, on the, the roof. roof, I literally like kicked my chair out, <laughs> ran a few steps and then threw my coffee cup along the ground. <laughs> I ran to the shelter, I was like, come over here! And then you stood for ages trying to get your camera to work. <laughs> It's good we haven't got any patients, but we're kind of getting ready for the influx. Yeah. So praise God. In the midst of all this, the falafel shop is still cranking, and we're about to get some falafel. Spicy, spicy falafel. <laughs> yeah, but it's funny the feeling you get when the bomb hits close. It's definitely just full adrenaline. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah, maybe something from the bomb has come off and hit it, or maybe he's just hit the concrete so hard that it's split open, cracked his jaw. And here we go, power cut in the middle of our. This happens often. We have a power cut in the middle of the. Paul said to the Corinthians that we have many teachers, but not many fathers. In my short time that I have spent on the field, I know that mothers and fathers are crucial and vital and invaluable. We've been serving in the Middle East for the last 33 years. We went to the city of Ankara in April of 1985. And uh, at that time, Ankara was a city of about 3 million people. And there was only about five known believers in the entire city. And uh, there was no Protestant churches at all. In our first year, um, we uh, purposed to learn the language and learn the culture and get to know our neighbors. Um, love the people around us. Speaking in a person's heart language is very important, especially when you're communicating the most important message known to mankind. <laughs> How do we sustain ourselves? You know, what, what do we do to endure the storms that are without question before us? One of the things that we absolutely need is moms and dads that will walk with us through the high, high highs and will stand with us through the low, low lows. And they're bound to come. Every human on the face of the earth faces highs and lows. Mama. Hey baby, what? Is there a toy for me? Go ask Judah if he's willing to share. 
As a mom of two beautiful toddler baby girls, I of course want the very best for them. But the best example for them is not for me to be as beautiful as I possibly can or to give them the best education they can have. It's to give them the example that Jesus is what matters most. Jesus receiving his perfect inheritance among the nations and among us is the only thing that matters. We had a, a house fellowship, which went on for some time, and then it, it eventually we merged our house fellowship with two other house fellowships in the city to create the first Protestant church in Ankara, and that church is still going today. I'm grateful for men like Hudson Taylor and Adonira Judson and so many incredible men that have gone before us that, that we can look back to and find inspiration and, and courage to say yes in the first place. And I'm also so incredibly grateful for those that are still alive today to tell the story that I, I was there 30 years ago and this is what I went through and this is how I overcame it. And I'm gonna stand with you until the end. The funny thing about it is during, while we were learning the language, we led our language helpers to the Lord. And Dan's language helper ended up marrying my language helper. <laughs> and they're, both of their families, their, and their families, yeah, their extended family came to Christ. I think in one family, yeah, 25 people came to Christ from one family, so. That's so awesome. I didn't know that. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> <laughs> Those that are, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead of me in this thing, what they have is so invaluable and so essential for life on the frontier. <laughs> there's, there's just something about living the reality of that in the midst of a conflict zone, in the midst of the darkest hour for a community or a family and saying we're with you in this and we we delight to share with you not only the gospel but also our very lives. So, yeah. A BBID. And I'm gonna keep on until I find Cause there is more love somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. And I'm gonna keep on till I find it. If I had to boil down Hudson Taylor's base methodology, in terms of how he would penetrate, how he would engage in an unreached people group in an isolated area. This is how we'd do it, through medicine and through prayer. Uh, we're just moving up with the convoy now. Um, I think we're about five clicks out from Bashka at the moment. keep on until I find it. Cause there is more joy. Okay. There is more He came to the conclusion early on that they needed a platform to run on in China, particularly in the interior. By pioneering medical initiatives, they could engage like spearheads into the most difficult, most inaccessible, most remote places in China. There is more love
There's always been this contrast between the major cities and the interior. And to some degree, it's why India remains so unreached because people have continued to go to the same cities and do the same crusades while the interior has gone neglected. It's like early in the morning and we've driven out to get here. And what's crazy when you come out here is that like, you've got like this little building kind of in the middle of nowhere and yet it just fills up with all these kids and this is pretty much their only chance at getting an education. One thing that you have to understand about India is that the population is very young. In fact, there's 600 million people under the age of 21. And so when we talk about extreme poverty and the things that go with it, like bonded labor or child marriage or um, trafficking and prostitution, these are being experienced by young people and children. Our education centres are very simple and they fit within that context of rural India. What it really looks like is just a bunch of kids, a bunch of school supplies and a teacher and some meet in buildings and others meet under the trees on straw mats. But what makes it so beautiful is that this teacher that goes into these communities loves the kids and loves the families and that's what makes it work. The first education centre was difficult to launch. It took us over 12 months. But in the three years after that, we launched 20 education centres, which really opened the whole region. It wasn't because we loved education, even though we do. It was because we loved people and education was really the key that gave us access to families and villages that previously wouldn't have welcomed us. So when Hudson Taylor sent his missionaries into the interior of China, uh, they knew that they would find war in the, in the ravages of suffering from, from war. What they didn't necessarily expect to find were uh, people who were in massive numbers struggling with drug addiction and, and tons of people had been sold into, into slavery. And they quickly realized that you don't get to pick and choose your battles. Uh, that, uh, that, that mandate of the Lord to go meant that when you find human suffering, you address it in whatever form you find it. And the, the parallels for us today are, are significant, that we don't get to just send medical teams in with the gospel to relieve uh, physical suffering, but when we find people who are struggling with drug addiction or people who are being trafficked into sex slavery, the gospel mandates that we alleviate human suffering by bringing solutions to that and the gospel, however and wherever we find it.
I first arrived in the Mediterranean Basin, I knew that human trafficking was an issue. I was completely shocked by the scope of the issue. In our first year here, we spent a lot of time praying and asking the Lord what it looked like for us to engage in the interior. What did it look like for us to go into the places where no one else was willing to go? So we asked the Lord for creative ways to get into the nightclubs so that we could have contact with the women who are forced to work in the clubs and the men who are voluntarily there. One of the ways the Lord gave us was to put together toiletry kits. There's really nothing special about the kits themselves. It was just basic everyday items that the women needed. We put these kits together and we took them into the clubs and it was there that we got to go into the places where no one else is willing to go. The places where darkness seems to reside. We saw the women, we got to look them in the eyes, we got to give them hugs and tell them that they were cared for, that someone knows that they're there. As the church, that we have a responsibility. We've been given great resources. We've been given great blessing. It's like, I'm gonna bless you so that you'll bless others. I'm taking you through this situation so that, so that you're gonna see my power displayed, so that you can help someone else that has a need. And I think we just, we have to be engaged in the world. The world is happening all around us. And if it's not us, then who's it gonna be? I mean, we have the answer to the question that everyone's asking inside. This is an issue that people are interested in and they have a lot of heart for, but not very many people are actually going into the interior. There aren't very many people who will walk into a nightclub and wrap their arms around these girls and show them that Jesus loves them and that they're cared for, that they're seen and that they're known. And so that's our heart is we want these women to know that they're seen, they're known, they're cared for, and there is a God who loves them and that wants to see them set free. And sometimes ecclesiological structures, you know, church structures, if we're not careful, they can almost become an idol. They can actually get in the way of reaching the lost. And look, as the world changes rapidly in front of us, we need to be people who are creative and indeed are innovative and who are listening to the Spirit of God, listening to the Spirit of the Creator, looking for creative opportunities. How can we reach the lost in our day? The sharing of our faith should be like a reflex. It should be a natural reflex. It shouldn't be something that we even have to think about. It should be natural. Because when you're shown grace and mercy, when you truly have the revelation of what he saved you from, I just think it's, our, it's a responsibility that we have. It's been such a privilege to pioneer with the Lord, to spend every day asking him what our next step should be and then watching him move and act in only the ways that he can move and act watching him open doors and close doors that need to be closed because this is his gospel that he wants to bring forth. It's not our plan and purposes, they're his. This is Barb here. Barb has been treating somewhere between 50 and 75 Peshmerga soldiers a day in our walk-in clinic. And then after a full day in the clinic, she comes out here and is treating civilians who are coming out of Mosul. So. We want to keep doing this dual focus. We want to serve the Peshmerga. We also want to serve civilians coming out. Some days it's really civilian heavy. Some days it's really Peshmerga heavy. So and we also have a 24-7 emergency clinic set up in the event of a mass casualty, either a, uh, uh, an attack or uh, someone steps on an IED or uh, a vehicle hits a roadside bomb that we're available to do emergency medical response. This is their entertainment room. Look at this stuff. Look down here. Oh, fresh tea. The location is called Nawaran. It's a, you can say it's a main, a main uh, place between main road or main place to get to Mosul. It's a kind of a main road between Sheikhan city and Mosul uh, city. We are here just uh, to see some of our friends and also to make sure with them they are healthy. Uh, there is a Zeravani, Peshmerga base called Zeravani. Uh, very important people, like commandos people. 
special force. We have some friends here, just we hanging out with them and also we did a lot of tests and help them with the medication. Uh, as I said, this is as a main group with the Peshmerga, as a, as a Peshmerga. And they did a very great job during fighting with ISIS, especially in this area. They, they stopped two big offense, offensive from ISIS they say, uh, last year when when was fighting between ISIS and Peshmerga. And also they, they helped a lot during our distribution and especially this commander, he, he's, very, he's very friend with FAI. He like FAI very much. Why do they like FAI so much? Because they have a good heart and also they try to help people as very soon and very fast. And also we are we discussed with them to, they have some villages very poor, and also some refugees around them. They asked us to help them by medical equipment. Mm. They, are, they are very, very excited and they are very helpful. They are very glad to see our guys because we, we've been with them before around one or one half year. We work it together and he helped us FIA a lot. That's why they are very excited to see us again. Crazy day today. Started with five patients coming in, and then two passed away. Three was able to stay, and then we. It seems like the town is taking a lot of fire and a lot of craziness happening. So we're just trying to help as much as we can. The gunshot wound entrance wound is right by the femoral artery. The femoral artery is good. So now we're going to do a thigh fasciotomy so that uh, the swelling in his leg won't cut off the arterial circulation. Are we giving this guy some morphine next door? Or are we him, but nothing is working for him. He has his brain. His brain is hot. So <laughs> let's go to the OR. We can check it out. We were just having a we um study of the Bible. We heard a jet well, sounded like a, either thunder or airplane fly over. So we were like, oh, that's interesting. Then a couple of minutes later, got called, come to the bomb shelter. And oh. heard another one. And so now we all just, we just got back. Um, the, the vibe amongst the people, they're a little bit worried because I don't think they're quite as used to planes as they are helicopters. Um, we just got back here now, and now someone's about to give birth. So we're off to the hospital to deal with that. Feeling good about that, Sally? I'm feeling great about it. <laughs> How about you? How are you feeling about it? I feel it? really good. You don't go to the bomb shelter, do you? You don't go to the bomb shelter. Me? Didn't go? No, yesterday no. Maybe after two days, I will, I will be. Hmm. Yes. Tamam. Ask Awaka. I was feeling two planes. The factor jet. I don't like them. But it's the reality we live with, so. We had heard bombing in the city before. Um, and you hear a couple maybe that fall closer than others. And I heard one fall, we were at the clinic, and one of the guys on my team said, hey, you know, that was pretty close, let's prepare in case there's patients. And I was like, okay. You know, but we hear that, we've heard that before, and there hasn't been. And all of a sudden they come rushing in with this 16-year-old boy whose leg is completely mangled. I've worked in emergency medicine before and it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily the sight of his leg, although that was um, traumatizing, but I think it was realizing, I heard that bomb fall and this is what it did. And connecting those two things, um, that shook my mindset a lot.
started as a regular day. We were thinking about coming and do some clinic, taking care of the locals, uh, taking care of the women. Um, and then all of a sudden we realized that uh, there was an offensive that was launched. Uh, therefore we received a lot of casualty. But within those casualty, receiving those casualty, there was also uh, in the mindset of us being safe. So it was a lot of back and forth between the clinic, taking care of bleeding patients, going back home, being in the shelter or in the bunker, and then coming back and take care of the patient. And then within that, the beauty of that is we ended the night and bringing new life in the world. So it was just this beautiful contrast between stopping bleeding, stopping uh, trying to preserve life, and then at the end of the night, bringing a new life in this world. So it was a rough day, but it ended up with a new life, a new sound of hope resounding through the night. Medicine is simply a way to get a chance to uh, show what, what's my life passion and driving my life, which is serving the, Jesus. And medicine allows a way in in almost every circumstance. Hudson Taylor's father was a pharmacist, and so he was raised and discipled in a home under the pastoral care of a medical professional. And this was incredibly formative for Hudson and the way that he grew in his convictions about mission. He understood that through medicine, there wasn't a single province in China that they couldn't engage. It was a, a basis, a reason for entering. It was a justification for their presence there. Um, it probably starts with my parents. So as a young kid, every year they would take off uh, one or both of them on a, on a mission trip. So I grew up on the stories of what God was doing there and just under, they made that just really uh, a pillar of, of who we are as Christians. I was very doubtful about my ability to do cesarean sections because I've never ever done a cesarean section in my life. I am a surgeon, but I've never done a cesarean section in my life. Just slowly over time, as time was approaching for that time, we had to decide whether we were going to do cesarean sections or not. God was just working on my heart and just instilling confidence, just having my teammates support me and pray for me. And, and my heart just totally changed and, and I just felt, you know, with the Lord, if that's what He wanted me to do, that I could do it. We went to surgery and we delivered a very beautiful baby girl in a very reasonable amount of time for your first cesarean section, very successful for both mom and baby. And um, I just knew it was all the Lord. I just knew that Jesus was standing beside me holding my hand, helping me do it. So I'm just grateful, I'm just grateful God would change my heart and show me what power He has. God. It's a humbling thing which I've noticed amongst the doctors is them coming in and then saying, I don't have what I need to do what I need to do. Therefore, I must go to the great physician and ask him to do more than would be possible in the natural. We need to pray for signs and wonders. And seeing that when we sit down together and pray for our patients and pray for one another, really is just saying, we're not God, we're not the answer, but we are here to do what He's gifted us with. But ultimately, uh, there is someone who can do far more and, for, and far better than we can with the little materials that we have. 
And we just feel like our lives in this community, we represent too that new birth, that new life, that new love, that God has looked upon them in their suffering and is saying there is hope in your future. There is something to hold on to. There is, um, there are better days ahead. And I think that's why we're, we've been called here to, to show them that there is a hope and it's not in the, the war, it's not in who's stronger, it's not in, in hoping for peaceful days, but it's hoping for a savior, it's hoping for redemption, it's hoping for salvation. These questions feel so hard to answer because I feel like I didn't do a lot except pray. And I saw many things that were um, gained through the team, um, one in the battle of prayer. And so many times when we come across a situation and uh, were asked to do something or there was a situation that wasn't moving, I would just go into my room out of desperation yet confidence and say, God, if you don't change this situation, then we're not going to be able to continue to do yeah, the small vision that we have or the small thing that's in front of us. You've been a tremendous blessing for FAI. Everyone, you know, all of the medical personnel who comes in and comes out tells me about, about you. They adore you. They love you. What's it been like for you working with FAI? Uh, this is the most important things for him. It's big problem. Sorry, I have to translate it before I continue. He cannot live, continue his life without the team. You have to know that. You understand it? He cannot continue his life without the team members. Okay, come in. I think with prayer and worship being the foundation of everything that we have done, it, it gives us a purpose. It means that our success is not based on what we're able to do medically or able to do as providers, but more so in our faith that Jesus Christ is the great physician and that everything we do is unto Him. Um, it takes the pressure off, especially when there's days when you don't have the equipment that you need, you don't have the testing that you need. He's living with the team, changes his life all, changes his soul. Never before he can able to be smiled. Nowadays he smiles, he's laughing a lot with the team. Actually. So the team teaching him a lot and changes his soul. He loves them so much. As I told you, he cannot live without them anymore. And he's welcoming them, all of you, I mean, and, and forever, I think the trust came from being authentic. Um, from day in and day out, I mean, we tried to worship whether we felt like it or not. We prayed because it was our lifeline, and I, I think that brought respect amongst the locals because they noticed that it wasn't something we did when we were in need, it's something that we did as, as part of who we are. This is what we do, we pray and we worship together. And um, I think just the consistency that we provided of being available. When you talk about the gospel being offensive, uh, I think one of the most offensive things that we did in, in Syria was allowing the locals to have so much access to us. That upset some people because they felt like we were being taken advantage of. They felt like maybe, um, you know, we should close the clinic. This is from the locals, but we look around and say, there's enough of us and we have access to heaven to refresh us and to replenish us. And so as we began to open our door in the last few, few weeks and particularly few months, that from the locals brought um, great admiration for them saying any, you know, we would say come any day, any, any time of day or night and we will welcome you and we will listen to you and we will pray with you. And I think when, you, when you're there and you give unrestricted, it does come with complications of how do you, you know, do this sustainably long term, but it does something in the locals' hearts when you're, it's not just a job, it's not just a nine to five thing, this is, we're here to serve you in whatever way we possibly can. Prayer and worship are the eternal realities. Mission is the temporal. 
what we are there for in light of this reality, first and foremost, a people of adoration and intercession before and long after we are a people of mission. So for me, coming into a war zone was huge. Um, the da there was a danger factor. So back home, it took a lot of processing to like let go. I, mean, I filled out a living will. Um, I didn't want to be weird about it. Like, okay, I'm going to die. But that was a possibility in my head. So I filled out a living will, prepared everything at home that maybe I wouldn't return. So it was a huge surrendering, like laying my life down. Like, not that I was going to die, but I was. it was getting my heart in the position of, I'm completely surrendered, I'm all in with Jesus. One of the greatest burdens and struggles that Hudson Taylor had to bear and wrestle through throughout the duration of his ministry, but particularly at the beginning when he was birthing and starting the organization, his greatest fear that he surrendered and laid down on the shores of Brighton Beach before he started the China and the mission was the fear that those that he would recruit and those that would join him would be mad at him and mad at the Lord once they arrived in the forgotten, out of the way village in the middle of the interior of China. What kind of person is suited for this kind of a work and this kind of a ministry? He knew the costs, he knew the pressures, he knew the psychological vexation, he knew war, he knew conflict zones, he knew death, he knew loss, and he knew how much it costs a human being to say yes to this task. This is the harbor where Jonah tries to flee from the presence of God because he got a special order. He got an order to go to Nineveh, to the Gentiles. This is a, a picture, this is a foreshadow that God is opening, that God is opening the doors of grace and mercy for, for Gentiles. But now, this is the foreshadow, and God is sending Jonah to these front lines, to the Gentiles. And I love this. I love to go to the front lines. This is where we should be. We should go to the places where no one has heard that the door is open. The door for eternal life is open. The door for grace and mercy is open. We should go there, to the front lines. This is what moves my heart. Why should I stay in places where they hurt? I'm a German. We heard the gospel. Go into all the nations until there are nations, till there are roots, till there are tongues that never have heard of the gospel. We should go there to the front lines.
one of the things that hits you when you sit in a place like this is that there were men in other places who had to knowingly uh, bear the weight of sending men into woods like these to, to die. When I was a young man, uh, that sort of thing that sort of thing didn't bother me. The idea of going someplace to, to risk my own life, it still doesn't really bother me, but the weight of, of sending young men and women into far off places where they may pay with their lives is, um, it's a significant thing. As a spiritual family in this season, what I feel like the Lord is inviting us into is to have, have this mind, have this character, this disposition, this mettle. The weight of that as a leader is significant, but the urgency of the hour, and the need um, for the Lord to raise up, as Paul says to Timothy, good soldiers who will endure and um, will proclaim the name of the Lord, won't deny His name. The, the hour is, is, is here, the, the, the urgency is great, the need is, is significant. It's just about being obedient to that thing that Jesus said, go. Acts 1, 8 is saying, you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. My Jerusalem, luckily speaking, was El Salvador. 85% of our population is Christian. What about Judea? What about Samaria? What about the ends of the earth, which is for me here, Middle East, Window 1040? Um, this was just part of being obedient to that call. Go, go and make disciples. And I'm grateful that these young men laid their lives down to, to combat Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich and the advance of the Nazis. I'm, I'm so grateful for them. I honor them. And yet at the same time, I cannot help feeling that the eternal gospel is more significant and demands more consecration and commitment and dedication than that of a soldier fighting in World War II. Around these forests, there are monuments and there are lists of people who gave their lives for a just cause, of course, but a cause which is in time, which is not eternal, just as the gospel is. The issue is not understanding the call. The issue is the need to see Christ. This is Romans 15. Paul said, I've, I've covered all the territory that I can from Jerusalem to Illyricum. I'm done. I have nowhere else left to work. And because I've laid foundations everywhere here, there's nowhere left for me to work where there's not a foundation. So I'm coming to you next, Rome, and then after that I'm going to Spain because I want to lay foundations where there are none and move to the next unengaged area. And I think, you know, I look at that and I don't see Paul's obsession with ministry. I don't see Paul's obsession with mission. I see Paul's obsession with the man that he met on the road to Damascus because that changes everything.
The context for the various people groups in northern Iraq post-ISIS is still very dire. There are thousands of Kurdish villages up in the north along the border regions where they still have very limited access to services because they're far away from the main, from the main cities and the economy has been damaged. They also get caught in the crossfire of regional conflicts that happen along the borders with Turkey and Iran in particular. For the Yazidis, they are the most hated group in this region and they experienced genocide at the hands of ISIS when ISIS invaded. Their women were captured by ISIS as sex slaves. And now that ISIS is gone, these women and the children that they had in captivity face a really difficult situation in their communities. They're free now and they've come back to their communities, but many of them are abandoning their children because their communities don't want them because they were, they were birthed by ISIS captors and uh, the stigma is just too much to handle. For the Mosul region, there are still many Shabak Kurds, Arabs, and Assyrian and Chaldean Christians who are displaced and they know that their homes have been destroyed and they don't really know where to go now, especially with a damaged economy and many organizations starting to cut funding and wrap up their operations here. The lesson that we learned with the rise and the fall of ISIS is that what people believe and how they act on it is really important. The battle for the hearts and minds of these people is not over. It starts now. We desire to have a witness in each of these people groups and we want to serve their needs. We want to show them the mercy of God. We have a clear biblical mandate uh, to reach every people group. Um, there's no question about that. So every people group is on the heart of God. God longs and desires to reach every people group. To me, this is kind of the epitome of the love your neighbor gospel. You know, just coming in, being neighbors, um, loving them as human beings, uh, developing long-term relationships. This is not the kind of place where you're going to hold a crusade and see thousands of people saved. It's going to be one-on-one -on -one relationships that are built over a long period of time. For us, we believe that God has called us to stay here. We want to stick with these people. We want to travel this road with them. We will lay down our lives for this place and these people that God loves. We believe that, that Jesus is worthy of this. And the frontier is where the heart of the Lord is focused. And that's where we want our hearts to be focused as well. Try and get some of these power lines lifted up out of the way. Tied up. Some of these power lines that are hanging down. We should try and uh -huh. get them lifted up. Yeah. I'm, I'm working for FIS around over two years. But the main point which was interesting for me to work for the FAI, they are very active and they they are very helpful and also they are very uh, very fast with their activity because we've seen a lot of uh, NGOs or specialists who belong to UN they just try to waste the time but the, the FIA was really uh, amazing because they try to get to the area as soon as possible with a very fast way that's what that's this is one of the main reasons I like it with FIA and also because they have a very good heart they feel people very fast and very soon. This is these two points make me made me work with FAI. Oh, 
when you have a group of people who have one type mindset and then a group of people who have another mindset and I think it can be quite difficult to try and live freely or keep the freedom that I have as a woman in, in Jesus um, in an environment where you know you have to be respectful or um, yeah you want to be respectful to the culture because you want you don't want to offend them but then you don't know where the line is it's a very fine line to walk or feels quite a fine line to walk at times because you wanted to be respectful but yet you don't want to have to come under the same heaviness or restriction that they live under because they don't know the freedom that we know in Jesus and so it can be it's a tricky line to walk and I'm feeling like every time something comes up where I'm like oh that doesn't sit right with me I'm constantly asking okay Holy Spirit how do I respond to this or how do I what do you what do you want me to say or act or not say or not act and yes it's a cultural thing but it's also actually like what in me God are you trying to change like what are you wanting me to die to so that you can live more through me um, so it's amazing how God brings different people in different cultures and different places into your life so that you can die more to be more like him. And I think this question is one of the great questions that we have to grapple with in our generation. The cost, not just the cost of potentially losing your life, the big yes, but what about all the thousand yeses that lead to that big yes? I think you really have to consider the cost of what it means to come to a place like this, you know, like really way, am I, am I willing to give, give up everything to, to serve uh, people who have nothing, you know, and uh, even your life, you know, are you willing to die? And I think the reality is like, God is worthy of that. You know, it's not, it's not about me and I'm this great person. God is worthy of that. He's worthy of that sacrifice because that's what he did for us. I want a heart, a heart that's burning on fire for Jesus the rest of my life till I take my last breath. And I think that's going to involve being in the mission field, doing mission work in this kind of context, but wherever he calls me. wants to bring us to that place of Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. It says, who is this coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? To me, that's the picture of Christian maturity. We're leaning wholly on him, leaning on the beloved. And if we learn how to do that, if we practice doing that, then indeed we will bear much fruit. The Lord hasn't called each of us to be a martyr, but He has called all of us to walk with a martyr mentality and a martyr spirit and to embrace a martyr theology, which says Jesus is worth more than anything I could gain in life and worth more than anything I would lose in death. And I think this is at the heart of the story and the legacy of Hudson Taylor, and my hope is that this would be at the heart of the legacy of FAI. Here in Syria, that's something that the Lord has been drawing out in my heart is just, will you abide with me? He said, Jesus says that 
if you abide with me, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's really true here. It's the, it's the substance of, of what we're doing here. So to abide in Him and have the substance of our, of our life, um, have the, the fruit of our labor be, be in Jesus. This is an incredibly unique place for the Lord to stretch and grow you. And I feel like here I have learned both who I am to Him and who He is to me in a way that I never dreamed that I would. My identity in Him. In the end, when we look back over three decades on the field, we would never wanted to have missed out on the joy of seeing people discover the scriptures for the first time and have their sin fall off, that heavy load fall off of people and go on to become what God has created them to become. It. There's nothing like it. And it's worth every sacrifice. And there are sacrifices. It means leaving your home, your culture, your dreams, your ideas of what you should be, uh, and just trusting God. And really, He will bring more out of your life than you ever dreamed was in it. It's, it's worth it. Is there a common theme to the threat of their families? Were their families against them coming? Or I don't know. Many times um, that's the case. For many, they have left um, families with significant needs. Um, so it's a it's unusual. You sit with a team member who's, um, you know, speaking to her auntie who's having her family call from the hospice, and they're saying goodbye in Syria. Um, yeah, what I've noticed is that the team have a common thread of compassion and empathy and trust. Like, I can't fix my family. And for many, the, the team members' families are actually are not well or um, are struggling themselves. But there's a, there's a belief that um, if I go, he will, he will take care of my family. He'll take care of all things. So um, it's interesting for most of us, um, when you even mention family, it's emotional because uh, we all have a story of um, being in impossible situations in our own family and coming to Syria and being in another impossible situation um, but a trust that if you um, if you seek him you'll find him and that he he is God and that um, in some ways we're not God to our families um, but yes that's a common common theme is that um, families have in, in their own way been in crisis and said go. It's right that you go. The difference between the life I was living seven to eight years ago and the life I'm living now is immensely different and it's much more gratifying and satisfying. I had everything. I had everything you could possibly want in the western sense and the worldly sense. I'm not satisfying without Jesus. There's more. I've been working a little bit on memorizing that in Arabic as a way of getting into the culture and getting into the language more of that. And that fact that Jesus is the true vine. He says, I am the true vine. I'm the true vine. Like what are we here for? To make known the unsearchable riches of Christ and the, the mystery that's been hidden in God for ages. Um, and how are we to make known the unsearchable riches of Christ unless we're abiding in that, unless we're living in that daily, unless we're drawing from that daily. Yes. Syria has changed me.
Saturdays in Jerusalem are incredible. On Friday night, Shabbat begins. No restaurants are open, no cafes are open, no places of business are open, everything's closed. There's very little traffic, there's very little movement outside. It's just, there's just this hushed rest. Every Shabbat in Jerusalem always reminds me of the Sabbath epoch that history will culminate in. The reality of Shabbat, but the reality of the the coming reign of God on earth, the coming rest and redemption for Israel and for the nations. What this communicates to us is that our primary identity in eternity is not as missionaries. It's not as laborers. It's not as servants. Our primary identity is as sons. And this is powerful because what this does is it empowers us to take up the identity as soldiers now with confidence and boldness and zeal and a settled heart knowing that one day wars will cease. And when wars cease, Christ will be all in all and He will reign and rule from this city forevermore. He will wipe away every tear and a river of healing will flow forth from this very city and it will heal the nations. You know, it's interesting, Hudson Taylor in his biography, he, he wrote that as a young man, it was studying the prophetic scriptures related to the second coming of Jesus and his reign on the earth in this city in the age to come, that that message is what made him go to the nations and go to China. It's what made him a missionary. Hudson Taylor had this perspective that ultimately this age will end and ultimately mission will end. This, this quote that's from Hudson Taylor's commentary on the Song of Solomon. Our attention is here drawn to a danger which is preeminently one of this day. The intense activity of our times may lead to zeal and service, but to the neglect of personal communion. But such neglect will not only lessen the value of the service, but tend to incapacitate us for the highest service. If we are watchful over the souls of others and neglect our own, if we are seeking to remove the motes from our brother's eye, unmindful of the beam in our own, we shall often be disappointed with our powerlessness to help our brethren, while our master will not be less disappointed in us. Let us not forget that what we are is more important than what we do.